Hey there, welcome to the More Miles podcast. I'm Lauren. I'm Scott. I'm Michelle. And we are part of the More Miles Run Coaching team. Zach is not here with us today, but myself, Scott, and Michelle are here to talk about heat training and training in the heat. Scrap that. I don't want to say heat training. We're talking about training in the heat. Coming up on the summer training season, it is June, um, and things are about to change and get hard for the summer. So we wanted to make sure that we cover all things training in the heat, both how to perform at your best, how to adjust the way that you're training, and how to make sure that you're training safely and smartly through the summer months. Um, so we are going to just jump right into it today, but I do want to mention to make sure to listen all the way to the end of the episode, because I have a special discount code that we are going to talk about during the podcast, um, but I'm not going to share that until the end of the episode. So you're going to have to listen to all of the good information that we have first, and then we'll share that discount code with you. Um, okay, you guys ready? Let's jump into it. Okay, so it is June. Um, Heat, humidity is all on the way. We've had a little bit of it already, um, and then we are heading into the thick of it, really starting like next week, if you are listening to this right when it comes out. Um, so there are some key differences to training in the heat versus training to the cold, in the cold, and I want to make sure that people understand why it is so different, why it feels so different when the temperatures rise. So when you are going out to do any kind of activity outside, but let's specifically talk about running, your muscles are working. Those muscles are pistons generating heat to propel you forward as they, as they generating energy to propel you forward as they engage. As they are pushing you forward, they are creating heat. So when you go out to run in the winter or on a cool day, you don't feel any problem with that because your muscle, the heat that your muscles are generating is actually warming you up and making you comfortable in colder weather. Um, when the weather outside, when the atmosphere is hot outside, you're generating heat from your body that is harder to dissipate because the uh, environment that you're in is also hot, beating down on you and creating more heat on your body. So your body has to take the heat that it's creating and it has to release that heat somehow in order to keep your body safe and healthy. It is dangerous and unhealthy if your body gets too hot. So there are a lot of different ways that your body does this. And each of these methods that your body takes to cool itself down require energy, more energy than it takes to just work, just move, just create that heat in the first place. So when, one of the ways your body tries to cool itself down is sweat production. I think this is an obvious one. We all know that we sweat heavier when it's hot outside. This is your body's evaporative cooling system. Essentially, you are producing sweat, creating moisture on your skin. As that moisture dries, whether that's just from uh, evaporation or from the air flow against your body as you're moving forward, that creates a cooling effect. Um, but your body has to produce sweat and it's pulling that fluid from your bloodstream in order to produce that sweat. So you're working harder just to create that cooling effect in the first place. Um, one of the other things that your body does is it pulls your blood flow toward the surface of your skin in order to dissipate heat out of your skin or from the surface of your skin. So you're getting less blood flow to your hardworking muscles because that blood flow has to also circulate toward the surface of your skin to release heat. So you're, you're getting less energy return or energy delivered and oxygen delivered to your muscles because your blood flow has to come to the surface of your skin as well. So a couple different things that are at play there. Um, it's also important to note that because you're sweating, you're producing sweat at a higher rate than you would in cooler conditions. You have to drink more to replace that sweat. And if you don't, your cardiovascular system is going to be working even harder as well because your blood becomes more viscous. It becomes more thick when you are dehydrated and that makes your heart work harder to pump it through your system. It's not pumping as efficiently when you are dehydrated. So if you get to the point of dehydration, then your body is also already working harder and working overtime just for your normal blood flow and normal circulatory, uh, your normal circulatory system. So Lots of different things that change when the weather is hot outside. And one more thing I want to add to that is 
when it's humid, we're talking about this evaporative cooling effect. When it's humid, you're not getting the same evaporative cooling effect. So it, it just, you can't, that moisture is not going to evaporate off your skin in the same way when the air in the atmosphere itself is already humid and moist. So your body is getting less cooling effect when it's humid, which means that it has to work harder to try to produce more sweat, to try to cool itself down. So the heat is one, ha one factor. The humidity is another factor that is also going to impact um, how hard your body is working to fight against the temperatures. Um, on a similar note, I want to make sure that to touch on humidity, in addition to getting less of an evaporative cooling effect, you're also not breathing in as much oxygen when the air is humid. Now, this mostly applies to high humidity. It's probably not an effect that you're maybe even knew was there at all, um, but definitely don't notice when the humidity is a little bit more mild. But when the humidity is really high, you are actually breathing in less oxygen. You're also potentially, if you're someone who has allergies or is sensitive to particles in the air, if you have asthma, when the humidity is really high, you're not getting as much movement in the atmosphere and the air around you. So things like pollen, dust particles, those sorts of things are more dense in the air that you're breathing in also. So humidity makes it more difficult for you to breathe and it's getting less oxygen into your system as well. So if it feels hard to run when you go outside in the summertime, I want to drive home to everybody. It's not a problem with your fitness. It's not a problem with you. And that's kind of what we wanted to focus on in this episode. I think at this time of year, as coaches, as people who are running out there with friends, we hear all the time, what happened to my fitness? I can't run as fast as I could two months ago. Like, what is going on? I'm a loser. I hate this. <laughs> and it's not true. I promise it's not true. And if you have been training for more than one year, if you have trained through more than one summer, you've seen that difference. You have felt how difficult running feels when you go out on a hot and humid day, but you've also felt the opposite. When we get that first cool day, you felt the difference and felt the reminder your fitness is still there. It didn't go anywhere. You're just literally working harder. There's more factors at play during the summer months. So, okay. I just rambled and talked for a while. So <laughs> let's move forward. Michelle, let's come to you next. Tell us a little bit about how the weather affects our performance and with different weather conditions and also how we should adjust our expectations, whether that's a race performance or a workout performance. Tell us yes. a little bit about that. Yeah. So I guess starting with like heat and humidity, which is typically the mid Atlantic summer climate um, where most of our runners are, um, you know, we have heat and humidity we're battling and the hotter and more humid it gets, the more your pace is going to decline at a given effort. So like Lauren's already mentioned, you're going to feel like you're working harder to get to the same pace and we need to adjust our training accordingly. So that doesn't mean if your normal pace is a 10 minute mile as an easy run, it doesn't mean you continue at your 10 minute mile pace through the summer because then you're overworking, you're overexerting your body. You're getting out of that aerobic zone that we want you to be in. So even if your training plan, you know, maybe we, we program some paces in there that say like, okay, this is your pace range. But that's your normal pace range. It's okay to back that off and say, that's not how I feel good in this weather. So running off of effort or heart rate may be a better option for you if you have trouble dialing in where that should be until you can get comfortable in your own body and decide, like, where does that fit, feel? Does that feel easy? Does it feel moderate? Um, and the same thing goes with your speed paces. Like, we're programming at goal pace a lot of times or around goal pace or a little faster. But keep in mind that you're also – most of you, some people are racing in the summer. Most people are racing in the fall or training for a fall race. When we're praying those temperatures and humidity are going to be a lot lower – so that goal pace is kind of geared towards the fall race, not your current June level of training. So heat and humidity, because it's so hard to work in them, you do need to dial your pace back. Um, and then, you know, summer storms, I guess, is another one that affects performance is we get a lot of those. We get a lot of rain and thunderstorms. I want to say thunderstorms. That's kind of the time to come inside, hit the treadmill. Like we shouldn't be outside in a storm. Definitely not a tornado watch or warning kind of situation. So I'm not going to go through that. Just go inside, hit the treadmill, do your treadmill effort, go with that. But rain is like 100% humidity. Um, it's exactly what rain is. So you are battling a very high humidity situation. 
And on top of that, you're not able to let your sweat evaporate in a normal environment when it's hotter out because you're, you're wet already. So the cooling effect of sweat happens when it actually evaporates from your body. And when your body's soaking wet from rain, it is harder to cool yourself. So you need to prepare again, to slow down, bring some more hydration with you. If it's really warm, maybe bring some cooling towels with you, just things to kind of lower your temperature as well. But the, the moral of the story is really lower your, uh, your pace, find your effort and go off your effort. Trust your gut and just kind of say like, okay, does this feel like an easy pace today? An easy, comfortable pace? Does this feel like recovery pace? If you have a speed workout, that's a hard effort. Like let's say you're running like a half marathon effort. Tune in. Does this feel like I could sustain this at race pace for a half marathon? Like, is this where I should be right now? And it doesn't have to be your actual pace. It's the effort level that we're going for when the weather gets hot and kind of crazy. Um, so it's kind of where I want to leave it there. I think I want to, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I want, as you were talking, it popped into my mind. I want to make sure to drive home what you said about adjusting paces. Um, we, as, as your coaches, even if we're not your coaches and you're just following a training plan, um, no training plan that you ever have is going to be dialed into whatever the weather is on the day that you are doing that workout or the time of day that you're doing that workout. Like nobody can be that uh, detail oriented for you. So a lot of the times your training plan is going to have a goal pace in there. Let's, let's say that you're doing like a speed session. It's going to have a goal pace in there that we want you to work toward that's under ideal conditions. So let's say, you know, you get a nice day, you get a 50, 60 degree morning. Those are the paces we want you to shoot for. However, if you are in July and it's a 75 degree thick, humid morning, the temptation for the athlete is going to be to shoot for those paces anyway, because we want to hit those numbers, right? Especially if we're training for something that requires those specific paces. But it's really important to understand that during a weekly workout, we pretty much never want you going to the well on effort. We don't want you destroying yourself on a midweek workout ever. S save it for your race <laughs> if we're going to go there. Um, so that's why it's so important to actually do those pace adjustments that Michelle was talking about, whether you are adjusting by effort and your coach can put in, you know, okay, I want you to run these at, here's the pace I want you to target. That's going to be equivalent to 5k effort. And you need to tune into what that effort actually is for you on that day. Could I run a 5k at this effort today? Um, there's another resource. I'm going to add it to the show notes um, at the end of this podcast. On our website, we have an article on training in the heat, and it gives you, there's actually a calculation that you can do based on the current temperature and the current dew point when you go to do your workout that will give you a heat score. And that heat score is going to help you to adjust your pace based on the current weather conditions. Um, so I'm going to link that in the show notes. Please go to that site and use that web or use those calculations to know exactly how to adjust your pace on any given day because it's going to change day to day, week to week as we go through the summer. Um, I totally there's something else. I was, oh, the other thing I wanted to add to that. Um, I want to make sure to add the caveat that those calculations are an average. They're not perfect for everybody. The heat affects every person differently. So in general, the more of a heavy sweater and a salty sweater that you are, the harder time you have adapting to the heat, the more of a response you're going to see from the heat. If you are a lighter and lower salt, lower salt sweater, that's not the way to say that, but um, <laughs> you are going to have less of a reaction from the heat. So if you see your buddy down the street, like nailing their marathon pace in the middle of the summer, and you are freaking dying on your long run, no, like that's not a problem with you. That's just different people react differently um, in the heat. And that's okay. You just need to know how to adjust your training and then how to adjust. We're going to talk in a second about, um, the outside factors that you can control. Um, yeah. So I want to make sure to drive that. App, if anyone's on Strava, and this is like, again, it's a calculator, it's an algorithm. So we've talked about this, but for data nerds like me, who just love to have little scores to play with, if you're on Strava, there's an app you can put on Strava called do me. It's D E W me, me. And it will 
give you what about your pace was if it was in perfect conditions, which is good. And when the weather starts to get kind of crappy, like, and you're like, man, my run was awful today. And then it gives you like an adjusted pace as if you ran in like, you know, 40 degrees, 60% humidity weather or whatever. And it, it kind of helps your ego. Like if you're having a tough time, I think it's a good tool. Like when you're just thinking my fitness sucks, my fitness sucks, my fitness sucks. Try something like that and maybe add it onto your Strava. It's free. And, um, you know, it'll kind of maybe make you feel like, okay, well, if I was running under normal spring conditions, my pace is right on par, which is, it's kind of a nice thing to help with the mental side of things. That's cool. I didn't realize they had that yeah. feature. And it calculates in headwind and humidity and heat and everything. So even on windy days, if you're struggling, it'll tell you like, well, you ran eight miles into a five mile an hour headwind or a 10 mile. It's pretty cool. That is cool. So, um, I don't want to, I don't want to step on the toes of what we're going to talk about coming up, but I want to add one more thing onto that in, um, using the treadmill. So there are a lot of benefits to doing your training in the heat outside, even when the weather sucks, um, and including your speed work, your tempo runs. Um, it, there is a benefit to doing those outside. Absolutely. And we're going to get to that in a second. Um, but I also want to mention there's also a benefit. So we know you're getting some benefit from training those same workouts. Even if the pace is not quite hitting where you want it to be, you're still getting a benefit from the work itself. Um, if you are someone who's training, especially in the early fall, and you have a very particular speed focused goal. So let's say you have a marathon, a half marathon, a 5k that you, uh, not even a 5k, I'm going to say longer distances, but you are really targeting a specific pace and a specific time that you want to be hitting. There is a benefit to using the treadmill in the summer, because while you can get the work and the adaptations on your system as a whole training outside, what you're not going to be able to get when it's really hot and really humid is the mechanical leg turnover at speed. So let's say you're trying to run a seven minute pace for your half marathon in the thick of the summer, your pace adjustment might have you targeting in your workouts more like 715, 720 because of the heat and humidity conditions. You're getting the aerobic stimulus and the aerobic work done that your system is able to run a seven, an equivalent seven minute pace, but your legs are not turning over at a seven minute rate. You're not getting the same actual leg extension off the back of your stride. Um, the same knee drive at the front of your stride that you would be getting if you were running that 10 to 15 seconds faster. So, there is a benefit to doing some of your speed sessions indoors on the treadmill so that you can get that mechanical stimulus on your body as well, not just the aerobic benefit. So a lot of times what I'll have my athletes do, if they are early fall, they're not going to get a chance to train in the cooler weather. Um, have them do their midweek workout indoors where it's cooler and they can hit the actual paces that we really want them to be targeting. And then they're going to do their long run workout outside where they're actually in the conditions and preparing and adapting to the environment as it exists and, and could be on race day also. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in there. I think the treadmill can be a really powerful tool in the heat also. Um, okay. But coming back to the, what, what we wanted to get to there is the benefits of getting outside and doing the work in the heat. Um, Let's talk real quick before we get there about training in the heat versus heat training. When we, when we opened the podcast, I said one and I meant the other. Um, Scott, can you tell us a little bit, what, what does that mean? What is the difference between heat training and training in the heat? How do they overlap and how can yep. we use this? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I am one of those athletes that just – do not like running in the heat. Um, I'm a heavy sweater. I just, I complain every time that the heat goes up. Oh, here we are again. It's hot. But I'm also that athlete in the winter when I say I can't wait until the heat <laughs> comes because I can't make up my mind. Um, but uh, training in the heat, it, literally, I think what Lauren and Michelle have, have covered, it's the act of training in the heat, right? So we live in an area that gets hot and humid during the summer. If you're training, you have to train in the heat. So it's it's all about how are you adjusting your plan? What is your plan to account for that heat, right? As Lauren just mentioned, you know, maybe it's doing your speed work and your workout midweek on a treadmill, right? To get certain benefits out of that. Um, 
so it's the act of training itself. It's everything from how are you going to hydrate, how are you going to fuel, what gear and, and, and layers are you going to wear, right? Everybody's different with that. So everybody has to assess for themselves kind of what is most beneficial for them, right, to train in the heat. Um, so there's that aspect of, of it. Heat training is more of a deliberate act of training in the heat for some sort of benefit, right? And probably the most common um, example I can give is if your goal race, let's say, is going to be in the middle of the summer. Um, most aren't, but some may be. Or if maybe you have a destination race, right? Maybe you train in a colder area and your destination race is, race is down in Florida, right? You have to account for that. So you have to have some sort of strategy um, of deliberately training in the heat so your body can acclimatize and acclimate to what it is that you're going to face on your specific goal race or race day. Um, and there's a lot of different strategies that you can do with that um, to kind of get ready for that. But the overlap is, is again, where we live in this area is you're doing both in one. So if, 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 if you're training, you know, in an area in the summer, like we are right in the mid Atlantic and your goal race is going to be in a hot area, you're going to, you're going to be doing both. You're going to be doing the active training in the heat, but then also, again, specifically, you know, you're probably going to be throwing in some very strategic, whether it's workouts, whether it's, you know, fueling or different, you know, simulations, if you will, to get ready for your goal race. And that is heat training, in air quotes, you know, defined as the strategic act of, of getting ready with the heat. So I want to add on there too, heat training it can also include things like using the sauna, spending time in the sauna, um, or spending time in the hot tub or warm tub, whether or not it's an actual hot, hot tub, you can also do heat training in your regular warm tub at home. Um, but those are protocols that we would not use in conjunction with training in the heat. And I think that that's important to dial in because I, People are really interested and ask a lot about those kind of tools, training in the sauna, or uh -huh. not training in the sauna. Don't ever train in a sauna. <laughs> spending time in the sauna, <laughs> spending time yeah. in the hot tub. Um, heat has a very is a very real stressor on your body. So we are already doing training as a stress. We're putting your training out into the conditions of the summer, which is an additional stress already. And then if we were to also add heat training protocols, such as time in the sauna, time uh, in the hot tub, you are, are easily at risk of overstressing, overtaxing your system. That's too much stress. Um, so we want to really differentiate there that if you are training outside in the summer, you are doing heat training and you are getting all of the benefits that come with it, all of the adaptations that come with it. Um, and you should not also be doing ex external heat training protocols. Um, but those are something that are beneficial and you can do in the winter when you are training in an environment that's not equivalent to what you're going to be racing in. Um, like Scott said, if you're doing a destination yep. race or you don't live nearby. Um, so we just wanted to separate those two and make sure you understand, please don't do both that that is too much, that is overloading your system. Um, but if you are curious about heat training protocols outside of actually just running outside in the heat, talk to your coach mm -hmm. about that because that's very individual um, based on you, but also based on what you're training and what you're preparing for and the time of year that that would be appropriate. Yeah, and I also think too, the discussion around if you have a job, let's say that you're outside all day for eight hours a day, right? Or you know, I'm going to be in Gettysburg this weekend for a kid's tournament, and I'm going to be sitting out in the sun all day for two straight days. And although that's not heat training for me, right, those are the type of life things that you have to factor in, whether it's for that week of training that you're in or that day of training, you may need to adjust. So it's something that I just think is worth mentioning is what is your life like in the sun outside, right? Similar to sauna and, and all of that, you know, but kind of what does your life dictate? for heat outside of training itself. And you got to kind of yeah. marry those two together, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Let's um let's jump a little bit out of order here because I think that kind of just rolls smoothly into how do we adjust to train in the heat? If we are going to be outside all summer both for training and Scott like you mentioned like we live outside more in the summer. We're at the pool, we're at at amusement parks, the beach, you know, whatever it is. Um 
So Michelle, let's jump to you. What kind of things can we be doing to make sure that we are running safely and healthily during the summer? Yeah, there's definitely a few things, but I think the first and most important one is to hydrate with electrolytes. Like we talk about this in almost every nutrition podcast, but that's like the number one thing is to make sure you're drinking enough, but not just water, like make sure you're replacing the salt you're losing because you're losing so much more salt in the summer in the heat. Um, and even on a sunny day when it's not super hot out, like you're still sweating more with the sun directly on you. Um, so that's my first safety tip is to do that. The second is to make sure the clothing you're wearing is going to help you wick sweat away from your body, which helps cooling. Um, so every major brand has their own version of it, but like some of the common ones are Under Armour heat gear, Nike dry fit. They all have their own version of something that is designed to help keep sweat off of your body. Cotton is like a no-go in the summer. That's going to keep, you know, it's going to soak up all your sweat. It's going to feel heavy. It's going to cause chafing. It's not going to keep you cool. So you want to stay away from cotton t-shirts and the like. So look for technical fabrics. Um, you know, a lot of times people will say they like to run in looser tops in the summer. I personally will wear as little as possible when I'm running just to keep my core body temperature cool. And that's your goal is you want to keep your core body temperature as low as possible to combat the rising temps outside because your core body temp is going to rise throughout your run. And the longer your run, the higher it's going to get. So it's more important. The longest, the longer you run, the more prepared you are for the heat. Um, there's a saying that my father-in-law taught me that is you always dress for the last mile. And that's really true in the summer. Like if it's cool, when you get out in the morning, you might want to suck it up for those first couple cool miles and make sure you're ready for those last few miles because it's going to be hot. Um, light fabrics will reflect some of the heat away from your body. Um, hats will keep the sun off the top of your head. And we kind of touched, I think last year, like Lauren, you had a post about sunscreen. You want to be kind of careful with your sunscreen. So like obviously day-to-day -day life, you want to put sunscreen on and avoid um, too much sun exposure, but a lot of sunscreens will not allow you to sweat properly. So if you're dousing yourself in sunscreen on your runs, you might be inhibiting your body's pro cooling process. So that's why we recommend hats, light clothing, things you can do without blocking your sweat glands. Um, that will keep you cool on the run. And then some other little tricks you could do. Um, I think we talked about this with winter training, but instead of going out for a really long out and back run, it's probably wise to divide your run up in little loops near your house. So like kind of like, you know, if you're near home or near your base station, if you have like a, an aid station at your car, kind of make shorter loops. So that way, if you feel like you're overheating or you need extra supplies or you need extra salt or you need a change of clothes, all of those are within a reasonable distance rather than going, you know, let's say you have a 20 mile run and you end up 10 miles from home. Well, the only way back is 10 miles back is going to be a lot harder than if you're kind of like in a mile, you can shortcut back to your house. So um, just kind of planning your route, letting people know where you are, same things as the cold weather. And then um, before my really hot runs, I will actually put some ice in my hydration bladder <laughs> to make sure my core temperature stays cold. Because if you're drinking a cool drink, you're cooling yourself from the inside. Um, and so I'll shove some ice packs in my cooling bladder. There's extra weight, but it keeps me cooler longer. Um, so those are just my tricks. You know, maybe even cooling towels that you can access if you need to cool yourself off as well, just to put on your neck or your head. I want to come back and elaborate on some of those points that you made. Cooling is a huge one, external cooling. If you have never done this before, you are missing out on a huge benefit to making yourself feel better when it's really hot outside. Whether that's putting ice in your hydration pack that's helping to lower your core body temperature, um, getting yourself wet from something other than your own sweat. So if you have a garden hose nearby, if you're running by a lake or a river or a stream that you can get your, take a hat, get your hat wet or splash some water on your chest, on your shirt, um, any sort of water that's not your own that your body doesn't have to produce is helping with that evaporative cooling effect, but it's taking the burden of doing that off of your own system, off of your own body. Um, if you have access to ice along the run, so whether you're out and back from your car or doing loops around your house, if you can put ice on your body, down your sports bra, if you have arm sleeves, put it in your arm sleeves. You can even put ice in your shorts because we all know our shorts have lining in uh, running shorts. That is weird. It's going to feel weird when you put some <laughs> ice in there, but it makes a huge difference for cooling your core body temperature. 
And as strange as it feels, when you start running again, you will feel an instant difference in the way that your body is responding. Um, so if ice is something that's available to you to put on your body against your skin, do that. You can even put ice in your hat if you're wearing a hat. Um, one of the other thing, oh, I want sunscreen. You touched on sunscreen. I'm so glad that you did. Um, and that is kind of a touchy one because we do want to protect our skin, but the, that's how sunscreen works is it places a barrier over your skin. And as you can imagine, then sweat is not coming to the surface to evaporate in the way that it should be. Um, some caveats to add to that, you know, if you are someone who has to run in the middle of the day during your lunch break or something like that, you know, you need to weigh out the benefits there of how long you're going to be out um, and if it is worth it for you to be wearing sunscreen. Um, but sun protection can go a long way, like Michelle mentioned, hat. The UV clothing is amazing for both sun protection but also cooling because then you've got wet sleeves that are uh, helping with that evaporative cooling effect. Um, but also consider the time of day. If you can run in the morning, that is the coolest time of the day, absolutely. So running in the evening, if that's the only option that you have, that's your next best bet when the sun is getting lower in the sky. But the morning is the coolest part of the day and you have the least UV exposure at that time as well. So you're safer going without sunscreen if you can get out there early in the morning. Um, oh, and finding okay. a shaded route too. I forgot to mention that. Like if you can find shade on your route versus blazing sun that's going to make a big difference as well it makes a huge difference that that radiation on your skin even if it's not hot outside that zaps your energy like mm -hmm. so yeah if you can choose a shady route um that's key too um one thing I wanted to mention, most of the listeners that are, are paying attention to this episode, I think, are probably in the mid-Atlantic where it's humid. Um, however, or north, south, you know, anywhere that it's humid. However, if you live in a dry climate, if you are in the desert or in the mountains or somewhere that it is not humid in the same way it is on the East Coast, um, cotton can actually be really beneficial because cotton is going to absorb all of your sweat and then it's going to evaporate really, really well in the absence of humidity. So that can be a helpful strategy if you are traveling for a race that has you, you know, like I said, in the desert in, in Arizona is what I think of because that's where I spent a good bit of time. Um, it's unconventional. You wouldn't think that you should, you should wear a cotton t-shirt. That sounds terrible. Um, but you get a lot of absorption of your sweat and then it evaporates really quickly and really easily. Um, but that brought me back to one more point that I wanted to mention. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> chafing when you were talking about oh, that's clothing, a good one. That's the a good first one. thing I thought about was chafing because not only are you sweaty, so you're, you know, going to be head to toe yeah. wet. Um, but Part of chafing is not just um, water on your skin. It's because all of that sweat that's coming out has electrolytes in it. It has salt in it. So it's not just water. It's water with particulates in it. And when you're, that gets on your skin and you have the, then the moisture plus the salt plus your skin plus the fabric of whatever you're wearing – that's where you get into a nasty chafing situation. So Michelle's advice about wearing the least amount of clothing that you're comfortable with wearing, tight fitting clothing so that it's not your salty shirt is not like swinging side to side and rubbing against your skin. You're going to have a, a problem. So, um, and then using anti-chafe. So uh, squirrel's nut butter is a favorite of mine. Personally, uh, Body Glide is a favorite of mine. I don't know. Do you guys have products other than those that you like to use? I use Body Glide pretty much. I use something called Salty Britches. <laughs> I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, it's, 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 it's like a really small company, and I heard about it, uh, I think, on a podcast. But it actually works well for me. Yeah. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't stain my shirt. Yeah. Kind of a okay. side note. Like a, a lot of the anti-chafe products that I've used in the past have stained, you know, shirts if I'm wearing a shirt, but this one doesn't. I think it's based whatever it's made with. I don't know, but yeah. So I like it. So I had an athlete um, mention to me recently that she uses A and D diaper cream, like the stuff that you I've use that. on oh. diaper rash. 
And as soon as she said that, I was like, duh, that makes makes perfect sense. That's what it's made for. (laughs) But I never thought of that before. Um, So it's inexpensive. You can find it at any grocery store. You can probably Mm -hmm. even find it at a gas station if you really uh, needed it. So um, I have yet to try that myself, but it makes complete sense. So A and D diaper cream might be something worth trying. And probably good for after if you do get chafed. I would imagine that would be a helpful, helpful tool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And any new runners, you may not know you're chafed until you get in that shower. Like, I'm just going to warn you. <laughs> That's yeah. a special feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Go slowly. <laughs> Approach with caution. <laughs> if this is your first summer training, just please be aware. <laughs> um. Okay, let's circle back now. We went a little bit out of order there. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the benefits of training in the heat because we're talking about a lot of things we need to be aware of, be cautious of, but there are actually a ton of benefits to training in the heat. This is good for you, healthy for you, and productive to your training as long as you're doing it smart uh, in a smart way. So Scott, tell us about some of the benefits of training in the heat. I think first and foremost um, is if you've ever come out of the summer, you get into the fall and it's like that first really cool day and you're like, oh, wow, you know, I'm fast again. And it, it, you know, you were fast before you were just running through 90 degrees and a ton of humidity. So that is one of the benefits. And it's more than just, you know, you're running fast because it's cooler temperatures. Your body has worked super hard all summer, just like we've, we've talked about. I mean, your body is putting out in a massive amount of energy just to cool itself down, right? So don't worry about the pace, you know, understand and have the confidence. Your body is doing a lot of work. Um, I I struggle with that. I look at my pace and I'm like, oh, I'm not doing much work. I'm going really slow. But my body is really working. So know that when you get out of the summer and into the fall, yes, you know, you look down and you see those fast times. Yeah, the, the weather's cooler, the temperatures are lower, but you're much stronger. You know, you're just your your body, and you're you're just a much stronger athlete right now because of what you've gone through in the summer, or in the in the in the hotter hotter months. Um, another thing is just and kind of leads right close to that is the is the mental side of things is you're going to gain a lot of mental you know strength through that right. You got to train through a full summer. Um, that's mentally challenging. You know, just getting out the door. Um, but again, if you do it smart, you know, you take your time, you do the things you need to do to keep yourself safe and cool, you're going to reap those benefits, um, you know, when it, when it's when it's cooler. Um, and anybody who's got fall goal races, right, you're going to have, um, hopefully, you know, a, a, a strong race, right, because it kind of lines up, maybe not perfectly, but usually are in this area, you know, you're going to start cooling down around October ish time frame september is still really hot so a lot of the races that you're going to have is maybe your a or goal race in the fall you know hopefully you're going to see some really fast times right so you're going to have stronger performances you know, of, of running through uh the harsh months the heat so yeah, i mean those are just a few i would say um but i think probably the one that sticks in my head is just you, know, you feel like just such a faster stronger runner and you are because of all of the things that have happened to your body and it strengthened itself during the summer. Michelle, we were talking about this before we got on the pod. Do you want to touch real quick on blood volume and the cardiovascular benefit? Yeah. So training the heat, um, they call it poor man's altitude training for a reason. You get a lot of the same benefits as training in altitude in the heat that um, you get if you're running up in Colorado or Northern Arizona or whatever. Um, your body will increase blood volume, and this is what we were talking about. Um, both plasma and also your red blood cells will begin to increase, which the red blood cells are what carry oxygen to your working muscles. So, like, you're going to get the benefit of having extra red blood cells, extra oxygen to your working muscles, which is going to increase your performance when the weather cools. The caveat there is it only lasts for so long. So like, we don't carry that forever. It's going to be a finite time. So if you have heat up until like, you know, the last three, two, three weeks of your race, that's perfection. Like you're going to have most of those going into it. You still get some benefit the further out from summer training, but, um, you know, you, that's fall racing, like in October, that's why it's so wonderful. If it actually does cool down is you've got all those stores of red blood cells from the summer built up from months of training in the heat. It's not instant, um, 
and then you can carry those into your fall training. So you actually are getting more oxygen to your muscles than you would have if you were training for a spring marathon. Yeah, I think we preach that all the time that um, if you are racing in the spring, we try to encourage you to race earlier in the spring so you have a better mm -hmm. chance of cool weather because you've been training through the winter, through the cool weather. Conversely, the fall is a really popular time for distance racing. We Fall is marathon season. It's ultra season because for exactly this reason, you're training all through the summer. Then you get the break and you see mm -hmm. when you've been training through the heat, you get the benefit of racing in cooler weather. Um, yeah. I wanted to, one of the things that we skipped over was acclimation. And I wanted to make sure that we touch on that when we're talking about blood volume and, and the stress on your body of training in the heat. Um, there's an acclimation period to adjusting to training in the heat and getting the benefits of training in the heat. Um, and those are two, actually, I had one set of criteria and then I kind of changed it right before we got on the podcast as we were researching um, blood volume and, and how that changes in the heat. Um, so standard heat acclimation protocol takes anywhere from five to 10 to 12 days. It's a very short micro effect. Um, and you can just do this by getting outside, running outside when it's hot outside, your body will acclimate to the heat. I want to make sure to note what that means is that you're increasing your blood plasma volume so that you're becoming more efficient at sweating. Your circulation is becoming more efficient um, and your body is adjusting to that increased stress on your system of training in the heat. I want to make sure to note that acclimating to the heat does not mean that the heat doesn't affect you. Um, Cause a lot of people I think think, well, once I'm acclimated, I'll be fine. The heat affects performance across the board for everybody, no matter what. So once we, it, it actually starts in the upper 50s, low 60s, we start to see a, a decrease in performance based on the heat. The higher the temperature goes, the worse that that gets. So acclimating to the heat means your body is responding better to it. You are sweating more efficiently. You are breathing more efficiently and your circulatory system adapts to the higher demand. But that doesn't mean that your running won't be impacted. You are still going to run slower in the heat than you would on a cooler day. So just know that. Um, and then in terms of the red blood cell production that we were talking about, that's a longer term adaptation. So that can take what we, what we were looking up right before we got on the podcast. It can take about five weeks of running every day in the heat. Um, so that's really talking about like pretty much all summer long, your standard training schedule is going to be um, to get that effect. So you're going to see that in the fall, when you get to your fall race season, or you get that first cool day. Um, but that's a longer term effect that it takes some time to, uh, acclimate, acclimate to. Um, but like I said, I just want to make sure that people understand because we see this metric on our watch. Garmin has a heat acclimation score. Now, um, it is good to reach toward increasing your acclimation. Um, but just know that that doesn't mean that the heat won't affect you. And, the last thing I want to throw on there is that a huge part of acclimating, we're talking about increasing your blood plasma volume that requires hydration. Like Michelle said, um, when we were talking about how to prepare hydration is so, so, so important in the summer months. And I want to hammer home. That's not just during your run. You need to hydrate with electrolytes before you run. You need to be drinking and carrying more than you probably think you should when you go out for a run. You should not be going out for an, more than an hour without carrying a bottle or stopping to get water at your house. What, however you have it set up, I know people hate carrying their water for whatever reason, but you need to. It, it, it's really important to your health, your safety, and your performance. But then also after your run, especially a long run, hydration is going to be an all-day project. It's not just going to be sipping a glass of Gatorade when you get home. You need to keep drinking fluids and keep drinking electrolytes all day long. It can also be helpful to get high water foods. So think things like cucumbers, watermelons, you know, pretty much any fruit and vegetable, as long as it's not dried, um, has a high water content and that is hydrating also. So be aware that 
to get these adaptations, you have to be hydrating with electrolytes. Um, and that is an all day project, not just an on the run project. Um, okay. Michelle is going to need to log off here in a minute. And I'm going to talk about a, our discount code and our product that can be really helpful for you in the winter. We're going to talk about the NYX biosensor. Um, but before Michelle has to log off, I just want to, did you guys have anything else that you want to add before I talk about the NYX? I don't think so. No. Okay. I will toss on there. We are all out there struggling with you through the summer. <laughs> so just know. Oh man, are we? <laughs> don't. Please, please don't quit on your goals during the summer. If you are struggling and you are unhappy with how you're feeling, how you're performing, talk to your coach because this is a temporary state and it is worth working through. It is worth talking about all of these strategies and finding out how to work through it because when we get that first cool day, you're going to feel it and you're going to be so glad that you stuck it out and you stuck with it. So don't change your goals in July. <laughs> let's make sure that we get at least into August. July is the worst of it. It starts getting better in August. Um, so just know we're, we're in it with you too. And it's worth talking about it. If you are struggling, it's, it's okay to curse your way through the summer. We will get through it together. So, all right. Thanks for taking the time, Michelle. I know you were pressed for time today. No problem. Thanks guys. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is the NYX biosensor. We recently partnered with NYX. Um, it is N-I-X, NYX biosensor. What this is, is a wearable sweat sensor. We've talked about it on the podcast before. This isn't the first time, but the summer is the time that everybody can benefit from this product. I think it is amazing. Um, so the NYX biosensor, I brought mine down here. It is a tiny little, if you're watching on YouTube, tiny little rechargeable pod. This attaches to a sticker that you place on your arm. So like right on your bicep on the outside of your arm. It's not a needle or anything like that. People see me wearing it and they think it's like a glucose monitor or something that sticks into your skin. It's just a sticker. It's just a patch it goes on top of your skin. You connect the biosensor to it. And underneath that sticker, it is collecting your sweat. So it is on the fly collecting that sweat and determining your sweat rate in the moment, as well as your sweat composition. And it's comparing those to the current weather conditions. So you get all three of those feedback points. This is huge in the summer when we know that you are sweating higher volume and and maybe changing your electrolyte composition a little bit you might be sweating a little bit saltier in the summer so we talk all the time about how important hydration is and that you need to be using electrolytes but if you don't know how much sweat you're losing or how much electrolyte composition is in your sweat it's difficult to know what product is going to work best for you and in the summer what product you're using matters more so that's what this product is really for. Um, the NYX biosensor, like I said, the rechargeable pod that I showed can be used forever. It's not like a single use tool. You can, you can reuse it as many times as you want to. The sticker patch that you put on your arm is a single use. So when you order, you're getting the pod plus the sticker patches. And those sticker patches are, like I said, single use. You throw those away, um, but you can order more sticker patches. So you can use this as many times as you want to get uh, good data and good feedback on how much you're sweating through the summer months. Um, now, what you'll get in the app is they will tell you your sweat rate. So that's how much sweat you're using, how much sweat you're losing on any given run, any given time that you wear it. It'll give you your electrolyte composition. Now, your electrolyte composition doesn't really change a whole lot. You might sweat a little bit saltier in the summer, um, but for the most part, the electrolytes in your sweat are pretty consistent all year round. It's the volume of sweat that changes from season to season. So you can even use this temporarily in the summer to understand what your sweat composition is and compare that against which products will best match up to your sweat composition. So this doesn't have to be a tool that you use 
all the time forever. It's a tool that you can use on one, two, three long runs to get a good sense of how your body is sweating. And then use that information to carry forward. You don't need to keep using the sweat test again and again. Um, but what the app will do is take your sweat composition and compare that against the electrolyte products that are on the market. So it will tell you, this is your, the composition of your sweat. The, this is the full list of products. And here is where your sweat composition lines up. So you actually get product recommendations that best fit the way that you are sweating. And that's game changing. This is new technology that we've only had in the past year and a half or two years. Um, and it makes a huge difference. So like I mentioned, we recently partnered with NYX. It's NYX Biosensors, N-I-X Biosensors.com. And when you go to their website, you can use our code, which is more miles, M-O-R-E, M-I-L-E-S um, for 15% off your order at their website. So super easy to remember, nixbiosensors.com and our code is more miles. Um, okay, I think that's it for today. Um, anything else, Scott, that you need to add in there? No, no, that was fantastic. I think we copy, we covered this topic super efficiently. <laughs> We're less than we an did. hour. That's rare. <laughs> getting better. All right. Cool. Thanks for joining us. Um, you can find us on moremilestogo.com or on social media at More Miles Run Coaching. Um, and like I said, I'm also going to link in the show notes um, a, our resource page from our website that talks about um, how to adjust your paces, your, how to calculate your heat score, how to adjust your paces based on the current weather conditions. So you can find that in the show notes as well as the uh, NYX biosensor information. Um, okay. Thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good day.